We are talking reversing Hashimoto's on the show today. My guest is Dr. Anshul Gupta. That is the name of his book that we'll be talking about in his three-step process, as he says, for losing weight, ending fatigue, and reducing brain fog. Dr. Gupta is definitely an expert in this area. He's a best-selling author, speaker, researcher, and world expert in Hashimoto's disease. He educates people worldwide on reversing Hashimoto's. He's a board-certified family medicine physician with advanced certification in functional medicine, pet side therapy, and also fellowship trained in integrative medicine. He's worked at the prestigious Cleveland Clinic Department of Functional Medicine alongside Dr. Mark Hyman and he has helped thousands of patients to reverse their health issues by using the concepts of functional medicine. He is straight to the point. You can tell he knows this like the back of his hand and really grateful that he's written this book and was willing to come on the show today to share with you guys today because as he shares a statistic that I didn't know, you'll see me go, what? That about 90%, I think he said about 90% of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's. I didn't know it was that high, whoa. So um, he'll get into that. This is the autoimmune condition of the thyroid. And he'll talk about, you know, what people experience, how you can know and what you can actually do. And what's really cool is they even do consultations he shares at the end where you can, you know, get a consult with them if you want more help with this, which is fantastic that he also has that resource. So we'll link that up in the show notes. His website is Anshul. So his first name is spelled A-N-S-H-U-L. Anshul Gupta MD.com. We'll link that up and also the link to his book that you can snag reversing Hashimoto's. And then a quick few things, just reminding you guys, we've got my higher retreats in Sedona coming up April 25th through 28th. So if you want to dive deep into your soul transformation, the physical transformation, your mindset transformation while having the time of your life with some really cool, like-minded people out in amazing Sedona. Check out my website for that, taragarrison.com forward slash retreats. Um, and you can get the link and all the details on that. It's going to be a really good time. And then also make sure that you, while you're there on the site, you check out my Coach Tara app if you want help with training, nutrition, mindset, biohacking at a very affordable rate. And uh, my people are loving the app. We have really, really good energy going on in there. And then if you want one-on-one -on -one help, of course, you can reach out for higher coaching as the full gamut, customized, you know, calls with me, all of that stuff, a group, everything. So that, check out that on my work with me page. All right. Okay. Let's go ahead and get into it. Here is Dr. Anshul Gupta. Okay. So Dr. Gupta, we're talking about Hashimoto's, you know, and I, obviously this is your specialty. I'm so excited to learn more from you today and you have your book reversing Hashimoto's and the three-step process in that book. And so getting started first, um, first of all, some people might be like, what is Hashimoto's, right? Some people might be like, I, I have Hashimoto's. I'm that's why I'm here. So, um, I guess we'll just, I'll let you take it. What is a basic description of Hashimoto's and can you explain how it differs from other thyroid issues that someone might be having? Absolutely. A very good question because a lot of people, you know, like do not understand Hashimoto's completely. So Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition of your thyroid gland where the body starts producing antibodies, which starts a very slow destruction of the thyroid gland. Now, sometimes, you know, this destruction take, can take weeks to months to years to happen completely. And that's where the blood test, you know, kind of will detect this problem. Now, most commonly, whenever a, a person is going to their regular doctor to get thyroid blood test done, the only test they're getting is TSH, right? So Hashimoto's ultimately leads to low thyroid or hypothyroidism. And that's what most people get diagnosed with. But what people don't know is that the real reason of hypothyroidism or low thyroid currently is Hashimoto's disease. More than 90% of hypothyroid patients have Hashimoto's disease. More than 90%? So yes. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know that. Wow. So that's a very big number. So we feel that Hashim so Hashimoto's disease is the most common autoimmune condition currently worldwide. And it is undiagnosed most of the cases because people are not even ordering the right test to check for it. Right. So, and the reason why people should be knowing about Hashimoto's is that, you know, most commonly the conventional way of treating Hashimoto's or low thyroid condition is just giving this medicine called levothyroxine. So most people don't know is that this levothyroxine is not doing anything to help with the underlying inflammation or the underlying problem of antibodies. It is just a supplemental thyroid hormone that your body is given to help support your body. This 
destruction of your thyroid gland is happening continuously doesn't matter whether you take the medicine or not so that's the reason it is much more important to know about hashimotos so you can take relevant step so that you can safeguard your thyroid gland and reduce this inflammation reduce the antibodies Okay, let's get into blood testing. You know, I think <laughs> any specialist in the thyroid, I see them just kind of get this like a little bit like their fist clenching because they're like, well, all we're testing is TSH. Like we need so many more tests, you know, and I see it too when clients come in. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on with your thyroid because they only te- they, they'll test like TSH and sometimes like some random one, you know, like only free T4 or something. I'm like, well, we that's like such a small piece of like the function of your thyroid. Like, so can you... I guess explain why they're only testing TSH, what the old way of thinking is and what people Mm -hmm. actually need to test to look deeper into their thyroid. Right. So the initial recommendation was only testing TSH. The reason being, you know, like the TSH was the most sensitive marker to know whether, you know, a person has a thyroid condition, whether it is hypothyroid or hyperthyroid. So that was, you know, like the recommendation, like, you know, the starting off with. And Mm -hmm. most of the people still follow that recommendation. But what happens is that people have to understand that TSH is not even a thyroid hormone. (laughs) So the way it actually works is that, you know, the whole thing starts in your brain with the pituitary gland. That's your master endocrine gland. That pituitary gland produces the TSH, which is a thyroid stimulating hormone. It is just a signaling hormone from pituitary going to your thyroid gland to start producing thyroid Mm -hmm. hormone. Now, your thyroid gland actually starts producing the hormone, which is called T4, which is kind of an inactive form of thyroid hormone Mm -hmm. that needs to be converted to T3 in your tissue so that your body can actually utilize it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're only checking TSH, then you're not even checking the actual thyroid hormone and you're missing a big piece, you know, as you said. Now, there is another piece of it, which is the reverse T3, right? So basically, a lot of people uh, are not aware of the reverse T3. So T3 is a hormone which helps your body and reverse T3 is basically the one that actually doesn't let you know, the thyroid hormone do its job. So if T3 is a gas pedal in your car, then the reverse T3 is the brake pedal. So whenever you're getting a complete thyroid profile, that's where you need to get TSH, free T4 and free T3 so that you can know all different thyroid hormones and where you have the exact problem so that you can be treated properly, you can be managed properly or the medicines or something can be changed accordingly. Now, even this is only checking your thyroid profile. This is not even checking for Hashimoto's disease. Right. So to check for Hashimoto's disease, you need to get thyroid antibody levels checked. So the two thyroid antibodies are one is TPO, which is a thyroid peroxidase antibody. And the other one is thyroglobulin antibodies. Now, if any of these antibodies are higher than the reference range given by that lab, that is diagnostic of Hashimoto's disease. Mm -hmm. You don't need a biopsy. You don't need fancy ultrasounds or anything to diagnose it. Just the presence of these antibodies is diagnostic of Hashimoto's disease. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for laying that out for everybody. And then um, what are some common, I mean, well, this is like a huge part of your book, so it's a big question, but what are some common contributors? You talked about how, yeah, you can get on thyroid medication, but if you have Hashimoto's, it's like, you're not treating root cause at all, which is kind of the premise of like the old way of medicine is like, let's just treat the symptoms. And now we're having a huge shift into, well, why don't we find out what's actually going on? So that just stops happening. So what are some big contributors to what is actually going on, causing the autoimmune reaction of the thyroid in the first place? So that's a great question because a lot of people have this question. Well, why do I have a thyroid disorder? Why do I get Hashimoto's? Why, what is happening in my body? And if you go to your conventional doctor, they will say, well, We don't know. It just got triggered one day, you know, it happened and happened. So they don't have an answer. But Mm -hmm. the research does have answer. The research is clear that Hashimoto's disease happens because of an interplay between your genetic makeup and the environment around you. Now, as soon as this statement is made, people think, oh, it's my genes. So that means it is genetic. Well, that's not real, right? Just kind of talk to your mom or your dad and two decades ago, whether everybody had thyroid disorder or Hashimoto's, no. So it doesn't reach your genes. It is not in your genes, right? So what has changed now is the environment around us. And that is the main reason that we are seeing such a high rise of Hashimoto's and thyroid disorders. So what I've identified through my years of research is that there are mainly uh, five categories of root causes which are playing a role which causes Hashimoto's disease. So these five categories, first of them is food sensitivities. More and more people are developing sensitivities to different kinds of food because our food is changing at a rapid rate. Now, we actually interact with our food with the genetic makeup of the food. 
Now, with all the industrial revolution and all the different practices that we are doing, introducing the GMO foods, a lot of the foods have been changed at the genetic level. So our body doesn't recognize those foods. And then plus we are using a lot of toxins, especially these pesticides and sprays, which again harms our body. And that's the reason we are getting more sensitive to foods. So that's the reason most people are getting sensitive to either wheat, like gluten mm -hmm. or dairy or like, you know, soy and corn, because these are the highly processed foods that has been introduced to uh, to our current environment. So food sensitivities are a very big reason. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of people confuse food sensitivities with food allergies. Right. Now, food And they're two different concepts. Food allergy is a concept which is most commonly people know about peanut allergies, where, you know, you consume peanuts, you blow up like a balloon, or you have difficulty breathing, you land up in the hospital. That's an allergic reaction. Food sensitivity is that you eat gluten, your body doesn't flare up to the point that, you know, it has causes anaphylaxis, but starts producing very small amount of these antibodies. Mm -hmm. A small amount of these antibodies over the course of again, time and again, keep on destroying your thyroid gland and keep on causing destruction to like your gut and causing leaky gut. And that ultimately triggers right. or causes Hashimoto's disease. Right. So number one reason is food sensitivities. Most people have this as a culprit going on in their body. So that's one thing. The second root cause is nutritional deficiencies. Now, thyroid needs a lot of nutrients to make thyroid hormone and convert this thyroid hormone from T4 to T3, like zinc, like selenium, like vitamin D, like magnesium, like B vitamins. And what research says is that our food itself is low in these nutrients. Mm -hmm. There was a research study done which compared the nutritious value of food from 1980s to current 2010. And what it showed was that our food is lacking a lot of mainly minerals and vitamins. Mm -hmm. So even though we might be eating the best of the foods, but because our food itself doesn't have those nutrients, you know, our body doesn't get those. So a lot of people are low in these nutrients. And again, unfortunately, whenever they're going to the regular doctors, they are not checking for these nutrients like selenium, magnesium, zinc, and all those things. So people don't even know that they're low in them. Mm -hmm. so nutritional deficiencies are again a second big kind of category the third category is stress now this category is a big one because you know like a lot of people undermine the value of stress or saying that okay well you know like i can handle stress pretty good but we see that stress affects each and every person whether it's emotional stress physical stress mental stress you know even hormonal stress and that's the reason females get diagnosed with hashimoto's more than males because they go through these cascades of hormonal changes. Yeah. Whether that's you know, like every monthly changes or even big changes, like you know, do, going through pregnancies, post-delivery, we see an increased risk of Hashimoto's, menopause, again, in, increased risk of Hashimoto's. So these are all stressors for the body and the mind. So stress is definitely the third big one a lot of people get exposed to. The fourth one is toxins. Our environment today is laden with toxins, whether those are heavy metals like lead and mercury or mold toxins or environmental toxins like glycosates. All of these are major triggers or contributors to Hashimoto's disease. And the last one is the infections, you know, Epstein-Barr virus infections or gut-related parasites like blastocystis or co-infections like Lyme disease or Babesia or Bartonella, any of these things, again, do trigger or cause Hashimoto's disease. Mm. So you see, these are the big five categories. I know there's too much for most of the folks, you know, like to handle, but these are the big five categories, which kind of can lead to Hashimoto's. Thank you. Wow. I mean, you really wrap that up very nicely and concisely for such a huge amount of things to look at. And let's look at let, let's break into some of those a little bit. So nutritional deficiencies, this is a big thing for me, as you know, nutrition is a big part of what I do for a living. And being in the more holistic realm, it's I encounter in people a lot. Um, like, well, I just, I don't like to supplement anything. I just like to get all my stuff from food. I eat really well. And that's one that I have just noticed. Like, it's like, cause I've, I, I, I visited a regenerative farm where they were testing the mineral content and food they got from the store and their own, because they're really trying to balance that. And when you literally see that these foods have like almost none 
Uh, is some of the minerals, none like selenium zero, you know, should have their zinc is this big bar. The, the one from the store is like nothing. And so I think this awareness is just so important for us to have is like really worth it to test, especially if you're having some sort of health issue to get your, your minerals, your vitamins, whatever you can test, whatever is able to be tested, tested, because you might be eating and organic sometimes is even lower in some of these because they don't add them back to the soil. And depending on how well that particular farm is going that you have no idea because you just bought this organic apple or this organic whatever, you really have no idea what the mineral content is. And I do do mineral testing with my clients and I see it constantly as these huge, especially with thyroid issues, these huge deficiencies in magnesium, selenium, iodine's off one way or the other, you know, you, you see these, I see it every time, you know, so I can vouch for what you're saying and the work that I'm doing every day. Um, can you speak on like, how do you like to find out these nutritional deficiencies? Um, and then do you have any thoughts, you know, what are you seeing play out in terms of nutritional deficiencies in people? Absolutely. And again, there are different ways of checking for these nutrients in our body, right? You know, most commonly, obviously, is that, you know, checking them in the blood, but some of these nutrients, you know, like are not stable in the blood and blood might right. not be the best way. So some people are checking them in hair, some people mm -hmm. are checking them in the serum levels, mm -hmm. some, cheap, some people are doing in their RBC levels. So mm -hmm. again, it depends on person to person. We use yeah. a, like, you know, company called Genova. That's mm -hmm. what, you know, most commonly that we use that gives a good, again, a big uh, uh, overall, like, you know, checking in different ways, all these nutrients mm -hmm. that gives us a good idea. So I totally believe that, you know, checking these nutrients again and minerals and vitamins, you know, is important because then we can be more targeted in terms of what is low for right. that particular person. So we can, right. you know, obviously replenish it. Right. That's a food people definitely. Will... Oh, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. I said food definitely is also like one of those things that we use a lot, right? Because that's kind right. of those basic things, right? You know, whenever you are building a big kind of, you know, 10 or 12 story building, you know, if your ground floor or your foundation is weak, you know, like, you know, that, that building is going to fall. So that mm -hmm. foundation is the food. So definitely, because a lot of people don't even know what is healthy food and what is the right food, right? right? And so that's very important to kind of let them know what is the right food, how you can increase the nutritional mm -hmm. content of your food and having the varieties of food. So that is mm -hmm. very, very important. Mm. Um, I'm curious your thoughts while we're on, nu nu you know, nutritional deficiencies. What are your thoughts around iodine and Hashimoto's? So again, a uh, very conservative approach in iodine because, you know, uh, I'm looking at the research studies and again, they're very clear that low iodine definitely causes Hashimoto's disease, but even high iodine right. also causes Hashimoto's disease. Yeah. So the problem with iodine is that again, what is the best test to check it, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know that the blood is not the best way. So urine iodine levels are the only way to rely on. Even then, they are not the best way to check it, but that's the only way to doing it. But urine iodine levels are a little bit difficult to get. So a lot of people kind of don't check them. Mm. And people are taking high doses of iodine a lot of times. The problem is that, you know, like iodine is added to a lot of different vitamins and minerals. And right. people don't know that, you know, because now everybody's on supplements and they're buying off supplements. Okay, well, this is good for this. This is good for that. Mm -hmm. And iodine might be hiding in all of those supplements. Mm. So a small bit of it adds up and then ultimately people are getting too much. Mm. So always tell people, make sure you're looking at all the supplements, you know, like don't overdo an iodine, but definitely because again, for a lot of people, they're not eating seafood or sea vegetables because they're concerned about mercury levels. So yeah, now right. that's the only source of iodine and plus the salt they're using, you know, like they're using either Himalayan salt or sea salt, which right. might not have iodine into it. Right. So I always tell people, look at everything and then do a balanced way of looking at things. If you're not mm -hmm. eating iodine in your food, then definitely supplement it. Mm -hmm. But if you're eating good high amount in the food also, then lower le levels of supplementation is the only thing that is going to be useful. Awesome. Thanks. And then a quick hit on um, food sensitivities. So, um, I mean, I, I can see why you listed that off first, right? Because I just see it's like so often we're eating our problems, right? We don't realize that we have food sensitivities. And sometimes, you know, it's kind of obvious. Sometimes people are like, they're very sensitive to something and they're like, I don't want to eat that because like it, I am in the bathroom all day or, you know, I have so much pain or whatever, but can you speak on like, uh, are people always aware of the food sensitivities? Is it always obvious to them in your experience with Hashimoto's that they do have a sensitivity or are they sometimes sneaky? 
they are sneaky a lot of times because you know like because they are not giving you a full fledged of the symptoms and unfortunately mm-hmm. a lot of times hashimoto's patients already have so many symptoms right mm-hmm. they're tired they have brain fog they have gut problems they have right. skin problems muscle issues you name it you know they have all these symptoms so how are they going to differentiate whether these symptoms are because of food sensitivities or hashimoto's right mm-hmm. so very difficult so that's the reason and we have good amount of research at least on gluten that you know mm-hmm. like most people with hashimoto's disease you know have sensitive to gluten mm-hmm. and removing gluten definitely has improved not only their symptoms but also their thyroid numbers and these antibodies mm-hmm. so i do feel that it is very important to kind of the only way to know is obviously two ways first of all is testing mm-hmm. and then you know getting a food sensitivity test now the testing itself has its own problems we do not have a full proof food sensitivity test so I always tell people well, before you order a food sensitivity test just think what are you going to do with the results how nice. long are you going to eliminate those foods and are you going to eliminate them forever or how are you going to kind of you know reintroduce them so it's very important to know before you order a test what are you going to do with the results nice so we don't have a perfect food sensitivity test so that's another problem over there so sometimes mm-hmm. you do have to do an elimination so for me what i tell people is that these top priority foods like gluten dairy um, soy corn sugar which right. are the highest processed food just eliminate them for 4 to 6 weeks see how your body does because it takes 4 to 6 weeks for your body to process all those antibodies which are produced by these things because these are igg antibodies and not igm and igg antibodies takes 4 to 6 weeks for your body to process and completely eliminate from your body and then once you do the reintroduction then you might you be able to catch those symptoms nice excellent thank you Um all right so let's go over to a little bit more about your book you know I'm a little bit of a health geek so I've read a lot of books on the thyroid and Hashimoto's and all that can you talk about how your book has a little a different approach you know what what would you say makes you distinct in the way you're looking at re- and even reversing Hashimoto's which I love the name of it right because so often we get identified with these things of I have this and that's just how it is and I just have to take my medicine because i have this thing and i'm in this very victim role and there's nothing i can do about it you know what sets your book apart and you know and how you're looking at hashimotos and reversing the experience cuz really I, i i sorry i'm just adding real quick like it's you know you see i have celiac somebody has celiac well yeah you do have celiac but you can feel like you don't by not mm-hmm. feeding it <laughs> you know and so anyway can you get a little bit more into your approach in the book and how it's unique and the way you're looking at things with hashimotos absolutely so obviously you are absolutely correct that we have so many different books which have people have written about thyroid and hashimotos and definitely they are great books but what i realized was that you know as physicians and doctors we sometimes kind of talk in terminologies which becomes difficult for a layman person to understand mm. because we are writing you know thinking that everybody is a doctor but not right. everybody is a doctor <laughs> right so want to write a book you know which is like you know easily understandable with people to understand why they are not feeling better and then what they can do nice. easily to fix things to kind of you know a step wise approach of it but at the same time i didn't want to be that person where i'm just kind of saying okay well my word is a word and you know like mm-hmm. you know i don't care about the science and the research so i wanted to present the research and the science backing what i'm saying nice. so i have included more than 160 references or different research studies you know like you know uh, based on all what we're talking in the book so even though it is in a simple language but still has research backing to it nice. now the take that i have taken you know on hashimotos what i realized was that in hashimotos disease it's not only the thyroid which is affected which is also mitochondria Mm. now mitochondria is a teeny tiny kind of organelle present in each and every cell of our body without mitochondria we will not be existing and then mitochondria most people will know it as a powerhouse of the cell this is what we understood about mitochondria in a biology class let's say in 6th or 7th grade so and mitochondria is destroyed in hashimoto's disease what they did was that they actually took biopsies uh like not actually the biopsy they actually took the thyroid gland of people who have died from hashimoto's disease and actually looked them under the microscope what they realized was that majority of the thyroid cells have dysfunctional mitochondria they are not working in them so then i started looking well where well, they have dysfunctional mitochondria let me look at all the symptoms and interestingly each and every symptom of hashimoto's disease is actually mitochondrial symptom because they are tired and that's mitochondria their brain are not working and that's mitochondria they're not able to lose weight again that's mitochondrial metabolism 
So then I said, okay, well, bingo. That's the reason a lot of Hashimoto's patients are not getting better because we are only pumping them with thyroid okay. hormone and not doing anything for their mitochondria. So that's the reason, you know, we made this process where we are focusing not only on the thyroid, but also on the mitochondria simultaneously, obviously addressing the root cause. But when we are rejuvenating, we're re rejuvenating thyroid and mitochondria so that people get easier benefit and sooner benefit. And that's the reason, you know, on our protocols, people like within a few months, they see like, you know, a substantial improvement in their symptoms and the thyroid antibodies and stuff. Excellent. Yeah. So you have this three-step process in the book, and obviously that is like much of the book, right? So I know it's hard to wrap it all up into a podcast, but can you kind of give us an overview of your three-step process, the, that the path you take people down? Absolutely. So again, a three-step process is, again, I try to kind of... Uh, keep things very simple. So again, the three-step process, the first step is identifying your root cause. So that's what, you know, like, you know, all these different categories. So what people are looking at is this one root cause. And what I identified in Hashimoto's disease, people have at least two plus root causes, which are playing a role together and causing Hashimoto's. Most people are either eliminating a food or they are like reducing their stress, but they don't look at toxins or infections and other things. So that's very important to look at all the root causes and knowing what you're dealing with and then making a stepwise plan. Obviously, the next question most people have is that, well, how do I determine what root causes I have? So in the book, you know, I gave them certain questionnaires that they can answer and they can get a score or they can get an idea of what is going on with their body that can give some like, you know, determination into what major root causes are, what minor root causes are. And that's what people need to get started off with. So that's yeah. the first step. The second step is where we start rejuvenating the thyroid and the mitochondria. So that's where, you know, I made this mitothyroid diet where, which is focusing on kind of, again, using food as medicine to heal nice. people. Nice. And the concept of the diet is again, very simple. Remove food, which is bad for you and include food, which is good for you. So again, removing foods, you know, which already discussed, you know, like, which is the gluten, the dairy, the soy, the corn, the sugars, any kind of processed meat, any kind of processed food you're eating, definitely eliminate those. And then including foods which are healing, first of all, is all these non-starching, colorful vegetables. Each and every vegetable which has a different color to it has these phytonutrients, which are antioxidants for your body, helps reduce inflammation, but also give all the nutrients that your body needs to kind of improve things. Mm -hmm. Now, in this aspect, a lot of people are afraid of eating good quality vegetables when they have been told that they are bad for their thyroid or Hashimoto's. Yeah. This is not a reality. You know, especially mm. cruciferous vegetables. Now, this research study was done actually in 1940s and 50s, where the main reason of thyroid disorder at that point was iodine deficiency. Mm. And this research was done in rabbits, not even in humans. Wow. They were fed all these goitrogenous vegetables more than what they should be eating, like double the amount of a regular human being can consume in a day. <laughs> and what they saw was that these vegetables will slow down iodine absorption from the gut. Wow. On but rabbits. I did not know rabbits. that. I was going to ask rabbits. you about that, like the cruciferous vegetable thing. Wow. Okay. Thanks for that. Yes. So everybody said, okay, well, this proves everything. And we never kind of bothered to kind of do a research study on humans. And everybody is just kind of using that research study still wow. to date saying that that is bad. Wow. But the current scenario is that we have Hashimoto's disease, not iodine deficiency as the major driver of thyroid problems. And we do have a couple of research studies which shows, you know, like these all these vegetables are really good for Hashimoto's. Because again, where the cruciferous vegetables have compounds like sulfluorophanes, they have quercetin in them, all these antioxidants, which are detoxifying as well as fighting inflammation. So absolutely, they are good. So <laughs> please do not stay away from vegetables. They are your friend. If you have Hashimoto's disease, awesome. definitely include them. Very, very important to do that. Quick question on that, uh, you know, the gut issues that so often accompany thyroid. Um, what about like when somebody's first starting out and often like when they eat a lot of vegetables, like they maybe not be in a place where they can really process the fibers well. Do you just have them like back off on the quantities of those foods or do you have any thoughts on that? You know what I'm talking about? Or they, they eat Absolutely. that and they just blow up. They're so bloated. They're just in pain. Thoughts on that? Yeah, a couple of things, you know, people can do, obviously, like, you know, those people sometimes tolerate cooked vegetables more yeah. than the raw. 
So sometimes yeah. they can change that. The other thing is that they can add things that can help with the digestion piece of it, yeah. like adding apple cider vinegar with meals or maybe adding ginger in their meals, cooking with that, adding yeah. again spices like curcumin or turmeric again are good. So those are the things that people can do. Even with those things, if they're still feeling bloated or not able to digest those, then that's the time we back off, you know, all yeah. those high fiber foods because that's the only option that we have. Right. And then slowly build up, build back up. Right. Okay. Great. And so vegetables, um, where, where were we? <laughs> right. So then actually, yeah. The, so then actually yeah, the diet still have a few more things left. So one is a good quality protein. Again, protein is a building blocks for our body and we need it, you know, again, for a good robust immune system. So good quality protein, whether you are eating like meat products, which includes like the chicken, fish and turkey, even red meat, but make sure that it is organic and grass fed. That is fine. If you're a vegan or a vegetarian, again, using beans or lentils, you know, or these nuts and seeds are good sources of protein. Make sure you have good quality protein. Then the good quality fats. Again, as a society, what we have done is that in the last decade, we have created this fear around the fat that each and every fat is bad. What we forgot to teach people is that there is good fat and there is bad fat. We cannot live without fat. Right. 60 to 70% of our brain is fat. So we all need good fat in our diet. Yes, definitely, you know, exclude the bad fat, which is the trans fat, the fast food and all those things. But good fats like avocados, like fatty fishes, you know, your nuts and seeds, your omega threes are really, really critical for your thyroid to function. Mm -hmm. So again, we kind of are very, very like, you know, we want them to eat good fats definitely in their diet. And then comes the gluten free grains, again, whole grains like brown rice and quinoa and all those things to include in their diet. So that way, you know, like we are doing a well-balanced diet, including all the nutrients from all different angles, because each and every food that we're introducing, you know, have overlapping mineral profile that is helping support, let's say, zinc and magnesium and selenium. Multiple foods are giving them to the people so that, nice. you know, they do better with it. So that's the second step of healing start healing your thyroid and mitochondria and the third step is removing the toxicities this mm -hmm. is we remove like you know help people to remove their stress you know by in, you know incorporating some kind of stress reduction techniques and then we obviously build up their immune system so that we can remove all these infections from the body as well as removing the different kinds of toxins from the body by making a proper detox plan for them Nice. And I just wanted to hit real quick on that because I do health and mindset coaching as my day to day job. Right. And and so a lot of with food, there's so much mindset around it. And I know for people who whether it's SIBO or you know something like this with their thyroid or, you know, some other food sensitivity, often I find people delay healing because they hear cut out gluten, dairy, soy, corn and sugar. And they're like, no. I, never mind. I'll just stay feeling like crap. And what I would say, because I, I understand that can feel overwhelming, but what I always remind people is like, if you can take the list, like take the list that Dr. Gupta, you know, the, all the foods that he's telling you, and if you can find clutch things that you love to eat that include those positive foods, like, okay, I actually love roasted cauliflower with this one really good sauce. That's all avocado oil base, you know, primal kitchen has a good, uh, Buffalo sauce. That's all really high quality ingredients. And I love to put that all over my roasted cauliflower. And I love salmon with this certain glaze. That's high quality. Ingredient. I can't wait to eat that. If you can focus on the things that you love eating that fit what you're talking about, then you start to forget. You get so full on that stuff. You for, you're not like jonesing for those things. So stay positive. If you're listening to this and you're having that, because I, I just see, I can, I feel it in people. They're like, I, it's the get, they get in this place of like, I'm going to be so restricted and it's going to suck. And, and I'm going to, you know, and they look at this list and they see, fish, meat, and they're just, they don't know what to eat. And so that's why books like yours are helpful or, you know, there's a million tools, programs, meal plans, whatever out there, but find something specific. It's like, okay, I actually love sweet potatoes and eggs together. Like that one thing, you know, so focus on the positive of what you love eating that fits those things. And then you will just slowly start to forget about all the other stuff, you know, and eat your fill. And probably if you have hypothyroidism, or Hashimoto's, you're like, it's not going to take a lot for you to get full for a little while till that starts speeding up. So <laughs> you can easily find, find things. So I just wanted to hit on that mindset piece is like, focus on what you are adding in 
versus sitting in restriction of, I can't have this. I can't have that because that just causes people to spiral and binge and all of these things I found. So just throwing that in there. Um, all right. Uh, let's see, man, toxicity. I mean, obviously if you have uh, Hashimoto's super, super powerful to read a book like yours. So you're educated going in because there is a discrepancy in how different professionals, uh, uh, approach things. Right. But obviously you would, I would assume most likely working with a, you know, integrative medicine doctor, do you have like coaching services? Can people work with you or your team or like, where do you recommend people go? to get help. Right. So we definitely offer like online consultations to people nice. from all over the country or all over the world. So yes, people can work with us. And again, we have kind of created this ecosystem because we have been doing this for like past three to four years nice. where we can kind of provide supplements as well as all these advanced tests to people, you know, wherever they right. are. So they can know what exactly is wrong. Like how are you talking about toxicity? So a lot of people have this question with the regular doctor as well. And, you know, I've heard, you know, this person who is coming on this podcast about mercury toxicity or lead. Uh, so can you check more? And then they said, well, no, it's not real, right? Don't forget about it, right? But we right. know that these are, again, ways to check for these toxicities. And blood is not the best way to check them. Right. You know, we have hair analysis or urine analysis and other things to check for it. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, but again, you know, obviously do not discount the local doctor. So if you do have a local functional medicine or an integrative medicine doctor, then please definitely reach out to them and see how they can be helpful in your conditions. And some of the primary care doctors are also educated, at least get you started on the basic things. So I think all of these resources are there for people, you know, starting local. And if not, obviously looking global in terms of online consultations and things and working with them. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's always nice to work with, uh, professional is highly specialized in what you need and has all of the lab testing available that you can need with like not only uh, tools to be able to help, but also wisdom and experience. And like, under you know, <laughs> there's nothing like being in the trenches with people to help you learn as like, you just learn so many little insights of like, Oh, when that happens, we need to look at this and watch out for that. And, you know, so it's awesome that you guys offer that. Is that just on your Anshul Gupta MD.com? Do they go to that website? To That's get correct. That? Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. And then I, I'm assuming your book is on here too. I'm looking through. Um, uh, we'll link up your website and also the book in the show notes. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to ask you is just like, you know, having worked with people going through this, like on a more human level, like, are there any words of wisdom or counsel that you have for people? Cause I know at least in my experience, um, thyroid, is one of those things. It's kind of like I say SIBO, you know, people dealing with a SIBO journey, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or, or thyroid issues. I, I just see this, like they've tried, it's just kind of this energy of exasperation and just like kind of hopelessness sometimes, you know, and maybe they're hearing this podcast, like any words of wisdom, comfort, you know, uh, from your years of experience with this for somebody on a more human to human level. So I always tell people, do not lose hope. There is hope for you to get better. You know, do not let anybody tell you that you have to live this life, which is limited by this Hashimoto's disease. If you are not feeling better, then there is something out there that you have not yet addressed. And that's the reason you are feeling this way, mm -hmm. whether it's a particular root cause, whether it's particular something else. So mm -hmm. keep looking, keep looking for answers. And it is not so tough. Don't get overwhelmed. There is a lot of information out there. Start mm -hmm. with the basics, right? Make changes to your diet. As you pointed out, just focus on the positive. Whatever you can do, it all adds up. Mm -hmm. So start making a few changes. You develop a stress management routine for you. Start moving your body. Start eating healthy. And you are going to see changes. That will be motivating. Mm -hmm. Small wins. Focus on those small wins. Because if you can get those small wins that are going to accumulate and then going to boost your confidence to take that next step. So don't feel that, okay, well, you have to step back and then you are, whenever you're ready, you're going to go in completely. Sometimes you you will never reach that point. So start from wherever you are. There is no judgment out there. You know, we all are in this journey together of getting better, improving your health. So don't feel you are the only one suffering. There are a lot of people suffering, going through it. And, um, just seek out for the right help and right information and you will be better.
Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll make sure we link up where they can get the look at the consults and also the book in the show notes. Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for writing this book. I know it's a huge undertaking, taking the time to come on podcasts and share and for creating a system to be able to help people as follow up. It's awesome and just really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the work that you are doing, sharing all this great knowledge and information with people and working with them one-to-one is also amazing. So thank you so much for the work that you are doing. Thank you.